Um, our next speaker is Bill Harris. Um, he was the ECMO uh, coordinator for, uh, for our company for a long time, and he was a great mentor of mine, and happy to have him, happy to have him speak. Thank you. Thank you for all, all the people that are in here today and out in virtual land. Uh, it's nice to be here. Uh, once again, beautiful uh, Sanibel. Uh, so uh, in 11 hours, Title 42 will be terminated and there'll be chaos at the southern border. Oh, I'm sorry. New, new, different, different lecture. Sorry about that. Um, scary thought, though. Anyway, I can't possibly talk about all of ECMO physiology in the uh, 40 minutes that we have here. But I'm going to highlight some points uh, that I think are very important when we're working with our patients clinically. Um, as, uh, as my friend John knows, I'm a dancer. I'm usually going over here and going over here and doing classroom thing, but I can't do that. So I got to be tied to this podium right here. So if you catch me going off to the podium, tell me to get back quickly. We have a lot to cover, um, but I'll make the important points uh, necessary in red. Anyway, we know that ECMO... Uh, extracorporeal membrane oxygen, uh, oxygenation is the use of mechanical devices to support the heart and or lung uh, function in severe heart and lung failure. It's utilized in patients that are unresponsive to conventional care. Conventional care uh, often causes further damage, so high ventilator settings, which Eric talked about, uh, especially those high plateau pressures, and high FiO2, which he didn't get on so much, but you know, a lot of times it used to be 50% uh, was safe and 40% was safe. Now we're talking about under 30% FiO2 being safe for ventilator settings uh, to promote good recovery within the lungs. And also ECMO helps to uh, avoid the excessive doses of vas uh, high vasopressors and vasoconstrictor pharmacological agents. It allows, ECMO only allows a safer environment in red for the organs to heal on their own um, E, e, um, avoiding deleterious consequences. It requires, though, a thorough understanding of cardiopulmonary physiology, pathophysiology, and ECMO physiology. So I know we have people from all kinds of fields in here. So some of it I'm going to talk underneath you. Some of it maybe you'll learn something. Um, you know, but we're just going to try to hit everybody at the same time with this. So cardiopulmonary bypass versus venoarterial ECMO. For those of you that aren't perfusionists, we know that in Carter Point Bypass on the uh, left there, when we go on bypass in the operating room, we're totally 90% collecting the venous blood and uh, into our Carter pulmonary circuit and returning it to the arterial system. So therefore, once we're on bypass, we have no pulse pressure. We have no uh, pulse little flow. Uh, we have continuous flow based on our pump. Uh, and we also shut the heart off electrically. We just shut it off with a, a thing called cardioplegia, which is a solution of hyperkalemic, hypothermic uh, paralysis of the heart is what cardioplegia means. On the other hand, with VA ECMO, we're on partial support. So for the most part, we're going to have some pulsatility. We're going to have EKG. We're just, we're just contributing and helping. Now, in some cases with VA ECMO, with heavy-duty dysfunction, cardiac dysfunction, you have the pulsatility be very low, but hopefully with good oxygenation, good environment, it'll improve itself. Um, ECMO versus ECLS. In ECMO, uh, we, there's a, ECMO extracorporeal membrane oxygenation is a utilization of an artificial lung, always, or an oxygenator. Uh, the pump system is usually used, but not always. There are pumpless ECMO, like you see in the uh, bottom left there, that can be used uh, in some patients, which totally relies on the patient's uh, systemic blood pressure to actually stimulate the blood flow through the oxygenator and doesn't require an oxygen uh, a pump system. On the other hand, ECLS is more of a generalized term. Uh, it, it, it usually has a pump system, and it may or may not have an oxygenator. Uh, so like a ventricular assist device that we might start off, and if it's the right side, hey, maybe we need to cut an oxygenator in there. But ECLS, more general term than ECMO. So what is perfusion? Perfusion is the combination of respiration and circulation. No, no big deal there, but that is what perfusion is. Respiration plus circulation. In respiration, uh, we get our, uh, obviously, our uh, gases come from the uh, environment uh, through the uh, lungs, the alveoli. And uh, there's a molecular movement uh, through diffusion gradients of partial pressures. Now, partial pressure of the gases is a pressure that, 
that uh, would be exerted by one of the um, one of the gases in a mixture if it is occupied the same volume on its own. So we have in the environment, we have a higher PO2 uh, than the venous blood, and therefore you have a diffusion across the uh, gradient into the, uh, into the plasma, into the blood, and CO2 and the venous blood being a higher diffusion gradient over to the alveolus and then exhaled. Uh, some fun party notes, if we look at alveoli, there are about 600 million lung sacs alveoli in the lungs. There are, that's about a 1,490 miles of airway, which is like taking a, uh, a walk from Chicago to Las Vegas. So it's ex extremely, you know, party facts, you know. Are you going to remember that? I don't know after you have a few beers. But anyway, it's kind of cool. If you stretch all the alveoli out, they would be about the size of uh, four and a half 18 wheelers parked next to each other. And the total surface area of lungs would be about the, the size of a tennis court. So some funny party, party facts. Just as, a, um, just as a side note, how do we carry CO2? CO2 is either dissolved in the blood, that's the least, or it's carried as a carb carboamino hemoglobin, or for the most part, it's, a, it's in the bicarbonate, which is the largest portion of how we carry uh, CO2 uh, formed in the erythrocytes of our blood. And the carbonic acid is transformed with carbonic anhydrase enzyme to form CO2 in water. The CO2 is eliminated, and then the water vapor does what it's going to do in the blood circulation. So that's how CO2 is transported. Now, when we talk about perfusion, how do we integrate respiration, circulation, and consumption to achieve adequate tissue perfusion? Well, we have to look at content. We have to look at delivery. We have to look at consumption. Um, Obviously, many of you, this is a review. In the blood, oxygen is, it can be dissolved uh, as molecules in the plasma, which is not bound to hemoglobin molecules. That's a very small portion, one to 3% of total oxygen blood content, so negligible. On the other hand, um, when we have, uh, and then you can see the formula, normal partial pressure of ar arterial blood pressure, uh, PO2 95 to 110, we'll get into that in a second. And then we can look at all kinds of little fun formulas for dissolved oxygen. But interestingly, it can be, it can be up to 10% of the blood if we have PO2s greater than 500. Now, we generally don't do that in the perfusion world because we're worried about microbubble formation coming out of solution, but it can be a bit higher. But for the most part, obviously, most oxygen is bound to hemoglobin, which is 98% of the total blood content. Now, there are four heme sites associated with each normal hemoglobin molecule. That's not each red blood cell. Some people will, will think, well, each red blood cell is four heme sites, so it has, you know, four um, molecules. Nope, not, not the case. And we'll talk about that in a second. Um, the saturation is a percentage of those heme sites found with saturated with oxygen. And then the formula there uh, for total, uh, uh, for bonded oxygen is, as you see, and you guys have known this already, times the saturation. What's interesting here uh, that I didn't know about actually and forgotten about it is each red blood cell contains several hundred million, hem million, billions, million hemoglobin molecules which transport oxygen. And oxygen binds to each of those heme on the hemoglobin molecule. So it's not each red blood cell with four bonds, it's all those millions of heme, uh, hemoglobin molecules that are in, within each red blood cell. Kind of a fun fact. So if we look at the oxygen content, it's the total number of oxygen molecules in the blood. Uh, we look at the formulas of the content. Um, obviously, you can look this up on your own, but we're looking at content. Uh, the calculations will include, we do calculations to determine whether or not we're delivering enough to the patient while in ECMO. We're generally including just the bound oxygen only because it is the bigger part, delivery and consumption. We use and we're gonna talk about this later, about delivery versus consumption, only use saturations or content. Do not use partial pressures when you look at your formulas later on because you will be, it will be incorrect in your, in your uh, deciding factors on whether or not you're perfusing adequately. Um, on the other hand, oxygen delivery then, we, we see uh, at, at the cell, uh, each cell contains hundreds of thousands of mitochondria, which are located in fluid that surrounds the nucleus and the cytoplasm. And we have that opposite ex exchange of CO2 and O2 going across between the uh, arterial blood and the, and the cells themselves within the cytoplasm. Now, what's kind of interesting here is the oxygen delivery chain. 
If we look at the atmosphere, what's the uh, partial pressure of oxygen in the atmosphere? It's 159 millimeters of mercury at a 760 uh, atmosphere. Uh, once it hits the alveolar level, and this is probably review for some of your respiratory therapists, once it's humidified and you have a dead space, well, that drops down to 149 millimeters. In the alveolar capillary level, it, it actually drops down to 75 to 110 millimeters mercury if measured. Uh, because of the bronchial return and pulmonary vein shunts, it then drops down to 95. So we keep getting a diminishing of the PO2 content through the chain uh, from the atmosphere. Once it's in the arterial blood, this is where the big drop becomes uh, real. It's 95 millimeters or so in the arterial blood, and we get a 42% drop until it gets to the cytosol. In the capillary, it's about 35 to 40 millimeters of mercury. The tissue interstitium, 18 to 30 millimeters. And once it gets to the intracellular or the, the cytosol of the cell, we're only talking about 10 to 14. And on the mitochondria within the cell, we're only talking about one to eight millimeters of mercury to create the energy production necessary for the cells to live. So it's an amazing uh, chain uh, delivery uh, drop from the atmosphere down to the intracell intracellular makeup. Now, oxygen metabolism. Oxygen and substrates are provided to tissues. We provide it pr producing energy, heat, um, um, uh, CO2, and water. Uh, metabolism is closely related to the consumption. Let's remember consumption, the VO2, because that's going to be important in our formula. What is the consumption? And it's determined by direct measurement of oxygen content delivered minus the oxygen consumed per minute. Now, the oxygen availability in the bloodstream is normally five times the amount actually used by the tissue. So the body has a nice safety mechanisms. That's important, five times normally. Well, so only 20 to 25% of the oxygen is removed under normal conditions. Well, that makes sense because we have 100% arterial saturation going in and we generally get 65 to 75% saturation in the venous blood. Okay, so we're getting a good 20 to 25% back, so five to one. Uh, why is that real important? Well, we look at oxygen consumption uh, of the different organs, and it's a function of metabolism, the cell mass of the different organs, and on and on and on. But why does the brain actually not do so well when we don't have enough delivery? Well, the brain does not really store glycogen well at all. It's one of the few tissues, unlike skeletal muscle. Therefore, the ability for anaerobic um, energy production is very low, and it must be replenished continuously with aerobic or oxygen delivery. Okay, so that's important there. Now, what alters consumption? Well, hypothermia, or to decrease consumption, hypothermia, we all know that as perfusionist. Um, uh, paralysis, uh, hypothyroidism, what increases it? Uh, seizures, sepsis, hyperthermia, like a fever, inflammation, exercise. Okay, important information right here that many of you know. If we look at oxygen content normals uh, in the arterial blood, we have about 20. In the venous, we have about 16 cc's per deciliter. So the AVO2 difference, about four. Okay, the important thing here is there's delivery again, average delivery, about 600 cc's uh, per minute per meter squared. And our consumption average about 120 cc's per meter squared, three cc's per kilo per minute. Again, maintaining that five to one Delivery to consumption, important, important, important. And this is gonna be more important than looking just at venous sats and lactates and everything else to know whether or not we're perfusing the patient adequately. So the normal ratio to sustain aerobic mechanism, we said is five to one. The increase in consumption will necessitate, if we, so if we have an increase in consumption, it'll necess, necessitate what? Increase blood flow, ECMO. Increase the oxygen content. That might, that might mean increasing the hemoglobin. Uh, maybe right shifting the curve, which it'll do on its own. So we have more extraction from the curve itself. The, ball, the body, important, the body will tolerate, tolerate this well until the ratio is below two to one. Remember I said five to one? If it goes to two to one or 50% sat, arterial sats going in, then the metabolism will switch over from anaerobic to, uh, from aerobic to anaerobic processes. We'll see that in low venous saturations higher degree of lactic acid production rather than CO2, base deficit increasing, and systemic acidosis, and which result in, within hours of organ failure. 
Okay, we're getting to see why this is gonna be important in a second. So if we actually look at that curve, we have on the x-axis the delivery, on the y-axis the vertical, we have consumption. And you can see there on the far right there, we have the five to one, which we said we're normally at. And it's not until we pull it over to the left and we get to that two to one where the body will actually go into shock. So we can still be within a three to one delivery to consumption ratio and still be adequately perfused in the body. Aerobic respir respiration is 19 times more effective uh, for releasing energy than anaerobic respiration. Aerobic processes extract most of the stored energy from ATP utilizing oxygen and glucose interaction. Anaerobic processes leave most of the ATP generating sources in the waste products. And in humans, anaerobic processes are used for extreme and sustained efforts when aerobic processes kick in finally to galvanize the action as long as oxygen is sufficient. Aerobic processes produce up to 38 ATP uh, per glucose molecule, where the anaerobic is only two ATP per glucose molecule. So the anaerobic process does not fully comb combust leaving higher lactate levels. And I'm not gonna go too heavily into lactate, but um, we know that lactate is one of the substances uh, produced by the cell, especially during uh, anaerobic mechanisms. Uh, normally we'll see in critically ill patients, you know, two millimoles a liter. I know in some of the patients you put on ECMO, you'll see maybe 10, 12, 15 millimoles a liter. When you go on ECMO, even if you have sufficient flow, what happens to your lactate levels? They go up. Why do they go up, even if you have sufficient flow? Well, to make a quicker thing, we're flushing those, that lactate out that's already been produced while the patient had to be in anaerobic energy mechanisms, which is why we went on ECMO in the first place. So you're gonna see them go up initially. Does not mean that you're not perfusing per, uh, perfectly, we're just flushing it out and washing it out. Very important. So oxygen delivery anticipation in veno arterial, uh, when we're getting ready for VA ECMO, cardiopulmonary bypass, uh, we figure, well, we want to pick uh, cannulas or 80 to 100% systemic blood flow so that the oxygen delivery um, is, is going to be about a three to one or so. Well, based on patient size, but of course, neonates and pediatrics are going to be need higher metabolism. So we're going to base it on that. So 80 to 100% is what uh, we're looking at for systemic blood flow. And we'll talk about why that's important in a second. Uh, veno arterials, several ways to cannulate. My, uh, my, uh, my colleague over there, Dave, is going to talk about some of those cannulation methods of veno arterial and what's important. But the advantages of veno arterial, it augments the cardiac output of the native heart. Well, that kind of depends how it's cannulated. It does uh, uh, raise the systemic blood pressure because you're forcing blood in through the resistance of the vessels. You increase the oxygen delivery through the blood and improve systemic blood pressure with higher flows through the resistance of the vessels. And it's also preload reducing. We're taking out of the venous and putting in the arterial. I'm so good. Good. Disadvantages. Okay, disadvantages. Invasive cannulation to the arterial, arterial system. Okay, we've got to go into the arterial system. So if we have air embolism or clot embolism, that's a bad thing. If we're cannulated distally, femorally, then what are we doing? We're increasing, we're going retrograde flow, we're increasing the left ventricular afterload against the heart. That can be a bad thing. And we can also cause pulmonary edema if the LV is not unloaded. So we're going backwards. Let's say we have an incompetent aortic valve, or let's say the heart is just dysfunctional, and we're leaving 25 to 30 millimeters left, vent left ventricular end diastolic pressure within the ventricle after it pumps. Well, that can cause pulmonary edema, and uh, the vent may need, uh, ventilate, uh, a vent may need to be added to uh, reduce uh, hyperdistension or at least relieve the hard from the pressure so you don't have the pulmonary edema that's gonna be developing. Um, and veno arterial, um, we, so we choose the expected blood flow in the 80 to 100%, we choose the circuit components. Uh, we look at the DO2 to VO2, again, we like to see five to one, but if we get three to one, we're pretty safe, we're gonna have a good perfusion with it. Um, we should achieve arterial sats greater than 90 and venous sats 65 or so or better. Uh, if severe cardiac function uh, remains, uh, then we may have to go with a, a, a higher anticoagulation level to prevent clotting if there's blood that's still within the heart itself, and we may have to go to higher ACT levels. Um, we, but we want to go ahead, once we're on VA ECMO, that ha has been a dysfunctional heart, that we are using ECHO to see if the heart is improving with that better environment and that oxygenation through the coronary arteries. So we want to make sure that's happening. 
Uh, so a normal blood gas, uh, uh, and I got an Edwards thing on the far left there, shows a cardiac output, 4.7, heart's doing fine. ECMO flow, four liters. We get a blood gas, PO2, 110, PCO2, 44. Pretty good blood gas. You see a pulse ox about 95. Uh, lactate's a little on the high side, but we just went on. Hopefully that'll flush out. We're doing pretty fine with that. If I was to um, now the Vino Vino ECMO, well, let's change gears. We drain venous and we return, we drain deoxygenated blood and return oxygenated blood into the venous system at the same time. So the ECMO oxygenated perfusate is returned to the venous circulation, mixing with the systemic venous blood returning from the organs. The oxygenated blood mixing with the deoxygenated venous blood in the right side of the heart gives us a purplish blood, right? So we can't possibly imagine that what goes through the heart, 100% of that blood going through the heart, because it's from the arterial ECMO system, but it's also from the venous system, can be 100%. It's going to be a mixture of blue blood and red blood or purplish blood. So it's going to be less than 100%. So the result is a partially, oxy partially oxygenated blood product ejected from the left ventricle. Now here's where it gets really kind of strange. A lot of times we figure, what kind of flow do we need for veno veno ECMO? Well, we think, you know, it's like an RVAD. Well, we need an 80 to 100% of systemic blood flow. Not so. It is not an RVAD. We know that all we're doing is supplementing the patient's own venous blood and adding oxygen and blowing carbon dioxide off. So we don't have to get to 80 to 100% like an RVAD. We, in fact, we can, it only requires about 60% of the total systemic blood flow, um, uh, systemic arterial blood flow in the patient. So if you're picking cannulosages, you can safely get to 60 to 70% uh, and do fine with ECMO if you're reading the vitals well, and we're gonna talk about that in a second. So this is most important to understand, and it's often misunderstood. Again, we're looking at DO2 to VO2 ratios during this time. And um, um, the formulas for that uh, are, are thus forth, but you can read that in uh, the Red Book, and which I'll show you in a second from the ELSO organization. So that brings up the concept hypoxia. A lot of times patients, you'll see your doctors say, well, the patient has a PO2, arterial PO2 of 55 on veno veno ECMO. And they think that patient's hypoxic. Well, the venous sats are good. The there's no lactic acids. Your DO2 to VO2 ratio, if you do the calculations, greater than 2.1, 3.1. Patient's not hypoxic. Hypoxia is the inaction, inadequate oxygen supply to meet true tissue demands, content, delivery, and high consumption. Hypoxemia is a decreased oxygen content in the blood compared to normal. So you can have a patient that's hypoxemic, but is not hypoxic. Does that make sense? And that's when you kind of start to have your discussions with your doctors uh, when, when you do that. So I'm here to tell you that um, though, though they may be hypoxemic, they're not necessarily hypoxic if our delivery to consumption ratio is once again above the two to one or three to one, four to one, or five to one better. Now, I'm not going to go over all these formulas, but if you look at the Red Book, um, and again, use content or SATs, but if you look at the Red Book from Elso on Chapter 4, Dr. Bartlett goes into beautiful um, uh, explanation of those arithmetic, arithmetic uh, uh, values if you want to start calculating those things. It's pretty cool. So here's a patient. Here's a vicious cycle that, that happens that I see often. Here's a patient on VV ECMO. We have a PO2 of 55, PCO2 of 44, we have a venous sat of 72, a pulse ox of 85. Uh, we have a cardiac output of about 4.7 per liters per minute and a VV ECMO flow of 4.0 liters per minute. Anyone see a problem with this? The answer, because of time, is no. The, uh, the ECMO specialist say, no, that's really not a problem. Well, one of the physicians might come in and say, wait, 85? We need 88 or 90 percent. We're hypoxic. Wait, what, what do you mean we're hypoxic? The lactic acids haven't gone up. The venous sats are good. Um, why are we hypoxic? And we, if we do the, in fact, if we do the calculation, the DO2 and VO2 for this patient is 3.64. It's well within those limits above that 2.1 uh, that would show the patient might have to go into an anaerobic or shock situation. The vicious down cycle that I see, here's a scenario. Pulse oximetry read 83%, PO2 55. 
the clinician feels, well, they're not delivering enough oxygen. Must, must be hypoxic. Well, they're hypoxemic. They're not hypoxic. So they increase the VV ECMO flow by turning up the RPMs. Well, that makes sense. You want to turn up more oxygen you know, from the ECMO flow. Um, and, but then you're turning up the RPMs on the centrifugal pump, and what starts happening? You get a higher negative uh, pressure within the venous system. You start having chugging, uh, uh, intermittent chugging on the cannula. And what does the patient, what does the clinician do? They visualize the chugging. They look at the cannula placement. And what do they do then? We'll say, well, we must be hypovolemic. So now let's go ahead and give, give volume. Let's go give, 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 give 100 cc of albumin or give uh, plasma light. So we give copious amounts of volume to meet, uh, to meet the RPM so we won't have the chugging anymore. Okay, so the chugging stops. Beautiful. Perhaps now, what they think, and they don't see the numbers get that much better, but perhaps now we can go up on flow. So they go up on RPMs a little bit more. What happens? Well, we gave all this volume. We went up on RPMs. And all of a sudden, what we do is a clinical scenario that the ECMO flow did go up to 4.5 liters per minute. And look at our Edwards, uh, uh, the, the cardiac output did go up to 9 liters per minute. But look at our pulse ox at 67. Our PO2 went down to 38. Um, our venous sats went from 54 from what it was, 72 earlier. So does this look, and our lactates went up to 4.2. So what happened here? And actually, if I do the DO2 to VO2 uh, ratio, well, what happens is our x-ray got clouded overnight when this happened. And our DO2 to VO2 consumption at this point went down to 1.9 within that shock situation. Even though I went up on ECMO flow, I went down in the delivery of oxygen to the tissue because now there's that much more of that venous blood that's not being oxygenated. And my DO2 to VO2, even though I went up a little bit on ECMO flow, the, the cardiac output with the dysfunctional lungs was that much greater ratio-wise. My DO2 to VO2 went down to 1.9. Now we're getting in trouble. And our lactic acids are going up at this point in time. So the decision, and, and we have to watch this, because this, the decision that more ECMO blood flow is needed to meet metabolic demand may have been incorrect from the get-go. The decision causes the ECMO specialists to increase the pump RPMs. Then the chugging occurred. Uh, then we did intravascular fluid infusion. Um, the uh, decision to provide higher blood flow, but cl clinician was still not satisfied. And I'm not saying just the ECMO specialist. It could be the physician. It could be whoever's making the orders. Uh, it wasn't, uh, perfusion wasn't adequate. We're hypoxic. You know, they were so fixated on pulse oximetry and not looking at all the other signs. And, par and, and arterial PO2. Again, 50 to 55, arterial PO2 might be just fine. Hypoxemic, but not hypoxic. So now the decision again was to increase the RPMs. We got the chugging going along, the diffusion to even give more volume, which increased the CVP, it increased the venous capacitance, and increased the native cardiac output. We saw those numbers go up there. Decision to increase ventilator settings. Oh, then the, the decision was, well, ECMO's not helping us. What do we do? We go to the ventilator, and we up the settings from protective strategic low settings, and we ask the dysfunctional lungs to work more for us. And we go up high on the FiO2, high up on the PIP, high up on the rate. Everything that we didn't want to do, which is why we went on ECMO. We wanted the lungs to rest. You all have seen this, right? Yeah, a lot of, a lot of people say, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's unfortunate. Okay, so what do we do from there? The decision then, it gets more dramatic. Then they decide to add another venous cannula to increase the flow even more so. So we're causing issues where there wasn't a problem. Now, when all that volume going in, the clinician decided that the volume infusion was necessary. In some cases, this is justified in, to maintain intravascular volume, especially in septic situations in the beginning. But what we're doing is we're increasing the capillary space um, uh, between the uh, cells and the uh, red blood cells. And therefore, it's, it's having a harder time. We have to have higher PO2s to oxygenate and to pull off CO2. So the wider the interstitial fluid space uh, with edema, uh, the harder it is to go ahead and perfuse the patient. So we've made a problem worse. Agreed? Now, this happens in sepsis all, all the time. Now, we see it in the lungs. We see it in the skin. But this is happening with every organ in the body. And truly, when you truly have a septic patient, yeah, you have to keep the intravascular volume up enough to keep ECMO flow going. But we don't, and, and until the patient has reversed and the capillary beds uh, pores start correcting themselves and then you start pulling that water off. But if we weren't reading the signs properly and we were delivering more and more uh, fluid to that patient causing a septic type situation, 
we didn't do the patient any, any, any positive moves there. It really hurt them. And this happens over and over, I see in different programs. So a septic patient, yeah, you might have to give them a lot of volume on board because they're just seeping out all over extravascularly. But after a day, two days, three days of good oxygenation or adequate uh, oxygenation, hypoxemic but not hypoxic, the pores will improve and you can start pulling that water off. How are we pulling it off? Diuresing, hemoconcentrating, something that's effective to pull that water off when the patient's ready to give, you, give, it, to give it back to you. So it's more difficult for oxygen transfer and tissue delivery once we, and then you have multi-organ dysfunction throughout the body, uh, which has an increased mortality percentage. So we usually say, hey man, you made the wrong decisions, one plus one equals 12. Had the decision maker looked at other parameters such as DO2 to VO2 ratios, venous, venous PO2s, venous saturations, base deficits, lactic levels, as well as perhaps none of these decisions would have been made, we wouldn't have gotten in trouble in the first place. Hard thing to look at and watch. I have one center up in Lima or had one center up in Lima that actually has this chart on the wall and they actually have a, and it's beautiful because, um, you know, a lot of times the surgeons will come through and they'll look, they look at that pulse ox and that's all they'll see and they, oh, we got to go up on flow. Well, they have this nice big chart here where they actually have an, a logarithm in their computer that actually calculates DO2, VO2 uh, um, uh, delivery, con con uh, delivery to consumption. And it's beautiful have, to have that chart there. Um, and this is from Lima, Ohio, it's no secret. But it's beautiful because then all of a sudden they're starting to look at the chart rather than that pulse ox, that little bit of window of pulse oximeter on the mo small monitor. And all of a sudden they're looking at DO2, VO2, venous stats. They're looking at a bigger picture with one shot rather than that one number and basing an opinion. And it's a way to get away from that, uh, that, uh, that hyper concern that something might be wrong when in reality on VV ECMO it may not be. Um, this is uh, uh, probably my second to last slide, but very important here. I think I go to some centers where they're very blood conservative. Okay, that's cool. You know, the more blood you give, maybe the longer you're on the ventilator, even though we type and cross match. But we can see with this, um, this graph here, if we're delivering 240 cc's per minute of oxygen, the higher the hemoglobin, the lower needed, the lower the flow the lower the ECMO flow needs to be, okay? So if we have, let's say, eight, mil eight uh, uh, grams of deciliter hemoglobin or 24 crit, we have to be at 5.3 liters per minute to deliver the same amount of oxygen that if we had just given a little bit of red blood cells, maybe up to 12 to 13 hemoglobin, 30, 35 or so, now we don't need to be up in that 5.3 liter ECMO flow range, we can be down to 3.6 and 3.3 and still deliver the 240 cc's per minute oxygen. Why is that important? Well, you don't need the high RPMs. We don't need that extra fluid because it's chugging. Now we can come down on ECMO flow just by increasing the hemoglobin content, still delivering the same amount of oxygen, but not have to deliver, not have to rely on the high RPMs and therefore the infusion of volume to the patient. So, Talking blood conservation, you know, bypass versus VV ECMO. Generally, we try to keep the hemoglobins a little bit higher with VV ECMO for this, for this reason. That's about all I have, but I just, this was a nice surprise that we had the other day. I don't know if I can play it, but, you know, I have friends that have a, a bunch of uh, horses out there uh, uh, near uh, where we live an hour. And I don't know why these people, they never know when their horse is pregnant. And all of a sudden, this guy popped out after a storm one day. But they thought it was a guy. I don't know whether it's going to play or not. I have the video. Let's see here. Maybe not. Can you play right there? If not, don't worry about it. It's kind of cute. Oh, there he is. This was five days old. And they first told me, well, we had a colt. Oh, that's cool. And the next day I got a text. Well, it's actually a, a mare. It's a little full, you know, a little girl. So this is Ashley that, that came out. And we had no idea that Belle was pregnant. So um, she was new to the thing. And there's my dog in the background trying to be nosy. And mom's ready to kick her kicker to get her out of there, even though they know Lucy. So that's all I had for you. Thank you for your attention.